So tonight, let's get involved with some science of color. But first, let's take a little trip um, to a place where I spent a few years working as a field biologist and a National Geographic explorer. So this is down in Tembopada. Um, has anyone been to southeastern Peru by any chance? Any hands? A couple. Great. So let's hop on a flight. After a few hours, we're flying over the rainforest. So we're seeing um, going into a little jungle city called Puerto Maldonado. All of a sudden, after a little bit of time traveling more southeast towards the border of Bolivia and Brazil, we're finding ourselves way deep in the Amazon rainforest, where we're just traveling by boat at this point. So we get way, way out there, just a sea of green as far as you can see. We take a boat for several, several hours, and after a little bit of time, we start to see some really, really cool sights. So we start to see parrots and macaws. They're feeding at these clay lakes called culpas, where they're getting more salt. Start to see some really beautiful landscape cool primates, all sorts of wonderful wildlife out in this environment. And if you're really lucky, sometimes you can see a, a jaguar or something pop out. They're a little bit shy, but as we were passing by on our boat on our way out, he popped out and gave us a little glance. He was really pretty. So really, really cool stuff out there in the Amazon rainforest. And what really caught my eye while I was doing photography and doing research out there were some of the butterflies and moths with their just crazy colors, every single form that you could think of. So that's a little bit of how I wound up in the situation tonight. And so let's back up a little bit first. All right, how do we create colors? I'm sure most of you have seen some schematic like this of our visible spectrum of wavelengths, which for us ranges anywhere from short wavelengths, about 400 nanometers, those short little waves, all the way up to those longer guys, like about 700 nanometers, those longer wavelengths. So animals and plants have figured out how to produce just about every single color that you can imagine. And so tonight, we'll dive into a little bit of the nitty gritty details about how they do this. So just as an example, I'm sure we've all seen, and maybe you've seen back in the day when you were in high school or college and doing an example with uh, chlorophyll or plants. Um, chlorophyll is made of this large molecule, but what it's really good at is absorbing two different wavelengths. One is in the spectrum of blue, and one is in the spectrum of red. So like a classical pigment, what you're left with is green. So classically, that's how our pigments work. Just like in our clothes, most of it is synthetic these days, but they're selectively absorbing certain wavelengths of light. So whatever they're not absorbing is what you see. Another cool example that I really like is human coloration. So let's do a little experiment. Just turn to your neighbor. I know it's a little bit dark, but just look into their eyes really quick. It might have been a while, but what does their eye look like? They're really, really cool structures up close. Oh, we got the lights now. Now you have to. <laughs> All right, someone describe someone else's eye. Let's hear it. Blue. What else? Anyone got a really crazy looking eye? <laughs> All right, so by show of hands, how many of you have very dark colored eyes, more brownish, dark color? What about like more of like a hazily color? It's a little bit of a mix, OK? What about like greenish blue? A few, right? So. These are, um, top left is my dad's eye, top right is my mom's, bottom is my sister's, and bottom right is myself. So you can see there's a mixture, right? If you have very dark eyes, then you're just producing more melanin in those structures. Whereas if you have more greenish eyes like I do, it's really just a lack of melanin. And light is just interacting with the surface of your iris, and that's producing that greenish color. Because we don't really make green pigments, and we'll get into a little more detail on that in a few moments. So one more example of human coloration, which probably most of us are familiar with. Who here has gotten a really like, weird or crazy tan? Yeah, some are pretty bad. I used to have really bad sandal tans before I moved up to NorCal. And so if you've, ever, if you've ever really thought about a tan in detail, we have a really complex mixture in our skin cells. But really what's doing all the work are these cells a little bit deep in our tissue that are called melanocytes. So our skins can sense ultraviolet radiation, and they don't really like that, because UV, again, as you might remember, is a very short wavelength, which is high energy. So it can damage our cells, and it can damage our DNA. So our bodies respond to that. And so melanocytes are really good at producing melanin, and then those can get carried up and deposited in our skin in response to those UV rays. And so, of course, um, natural populations of humans can also just produce different levels of melanin. Now, is anyone here a true redhead, by any chance? Redheads represent. <laughs> Woo! So if, you're, if you are a redhead, most likely you have a certain type of mutation. And so that mutation, <laughs> in a good way, doesn't have to be bad. We're all mutants in some way. So um, this mutation is in a particular gene called MC1R. It's a melanocyte receptor. 
And so what tends to happen is your body's not super great at producing eumelanin, which is a darker form of melanin, but it's better at producing pheomelanin, which is more of that reddish hue. So, but it probably also means that you're not fantastic at tanning. And so for that same reason, your melanocytes are not producing and distributing that melanin up to your skin. So if you've taken anything away tonight, it's that you can tell your redhead friend a new fun fact. <laughs> okay, but the true masters of color, as we all know, are butterflies. And so you should talk to the other members here tonight on how you can conserve butterflies, especially up here in the Northern California area. But at the very least, we'll learn a little bit about how they're producing these incredible array of colors. Okay, if you've ever looked really, really close at a butterfly or touched a butterfly, anybody gotten like pixie dust? Anybody call it that on their wings? Who here thinks if you touch a butterfly, it dies? Yeah, I hear that so much, but we can dispel a myth tonight. They don't die. They don't, they don't even need scale, uh, scales. Scales are not even like alive cells at this point. But if you look really, really close, you can start to make out the fact that these are each producing one single color. So Lepidoptera are scaly wings, and they have these outgrowths that come out of their uh, wings, and they produce one single color. So we can kind of think of these like the unit of color in a biological system. You can think of it in the same way that our TVs or our monitors just produce pixels. But altogether, as you zoom out, start to make these really, really incredible array of patterns. So each one of these is not too big. They're about 200 micrometers long, about 50 micrometers thick. So just about the size of a human hair, more or less. Okay, so there are two primary ways, kind of like we saw in plants and in humans, that biology creates color. So we can do this through a biosynthetic pathway. You won't be quizzed on this later, I don't think, so don't worry about the pathway. But if you see dark color, much like in humans, um, they produce melanin. So these darker pigments through a tyrosine pathway, and then those more colorful pigments through a different pathway, like producing omochromes and other pigments like that. But same principle where these are selectively absorbing wavelengths of light, and then whatever is reflected back is what you see. But if you've ever looked at something really shiny or iridescent, actually, just out of curiosity, has anyone gone over to the California Academy of Sciences in the butterfly exhibit? A few. Everyone in here should go, because you're in San Francisco already. So just go over to Cal Academy. It's a beautiful exhibit. They've got tons of awesome um, butterflies. I know the curator there. And it's really worth your, your stay. But you can see butterflies like this. This is the blue morpho. But there's no blue pigment whatsoever inside this butterfly. What's actually happening is if, if you zoom in really, really, really close, so now we're talking like micrometer and nanometer level, you start to see these little structures on the surface of each individual scale. And they kind of look like Christmas trees, right? A little bit. So what's happening is light is just interacting with these structures and it's producing that blue wavelength. So this is what we call a structural coloration, just light interacting with and producing a physical property. So here's a little bit of a schematic. What can happen with these structures is that they're canceling out certain wavelengths, eliminating red, everything else. But they're actually, if wavelengths of light interact together, they can even boost their signal. And so we call this constructive interference. And so what they're doing is really just boosting and enhancing blue while canceling out everything else. And again, there's no pigment involved whatsoever. This is just a nanostructure. So you can do a little test. So next time you're at a party and you want to impress all your friends with the dead butterflies you have in your pockets, <laughs> you can take one of these morphos out of your pocket and take out a drop of ethanol. And below and behold, when you drop the ethanol on that wing, it will change color. What's going on here? Refractive index. Very good. So. Yeah, I don't know who that was, but do you want to come up here after? <laughs> so you're exactly right. What's changing is just the interaction with those nanostructures where they're temporarily being filled up with that drop of ethanol. The refractive index is changing the wavelength coming out ever so slightly. But as you could see, when it dries, it goes back to its normal iridescent blue. So the question really becomes, how does nature produce these amazing little structures? There are lots of different forms. Those Christmas trees are just one example. But biology is a really great nano engineer, so much so that our real engineers today really try and seek inspiration from biology so that they can apply those to developing new technologies. So much like light interacting with a prism, nature makes tiny prisms. And so what we want to try and figure out in our lab through researching butterflies is how do they build these structures in the first place? So there are lots of engineers and physicists who have poked around and prodded with dead butterflies for a long time. They've solved their fancy math problems. But what we don't know is how creatures actually create these structures in the first place. So what we do in our lab is we raise a lot of caterpillars. And if you've ever done that in your classroom, 
you know that they eat a ton of food, they're just little eating and pooping machines. And after about a week inside their pupa, they come out as like this brilliant thing that looks nothing like its original creature. So it's this process of metamorphosis that we want to understand, and in the process, try and understand how they develop nanostructures. So in our lab, we've worked on a technique where we can really just watch inside what's going on. So just by show of hands, how many of you have heard that a butterfly just sort of turns into soup while it's a pupa? Yeah, I think a lot of people. It's, it just, it makes sense, right? You kind of have to break down into like bits of goo and then you emerge as this miraculous butterfly. So what we can see here is actually what actually is going on inside. So we do this by removing a little ball of cells when it's a caterpillar. So we do this very finely in the lab and we should get paid like surgeons, but we don't. And so afterwards we can set them up under a microscope and then after about a week we set up a time lapse. So one image is taken about every 20 minutes and then we splice it all together and see what happens in that movie. So here is the process of a window into a butterfly wing developing. So what we're seeing in this movie is the chrysalis. You can see the wing starts to grow and expand. Now it's becoming a bit more opaque. It's depositing chitin, which gives it its structure. And then just like a flash, it turns on all of its pigment genes. So in the process, we've just built a butterfly. And the colors come in through the use of those pigments, like we discussed, and also through the use of structural color, through the thickening of those scales. So here's another close-up view. And if you notice in here, we get a little bit of blue coming in. And then again, just those flash of pigments. So one more, just up really, really close. You start to see each one of those scales develop. And you might notice it goes through a little bit of a rainbow. Because as those scales are thickening, it becomes ever so slightly changing that refractive index of light. And just one more example in a different butterfly that's native to here. This is the painted lady. And it becomes a little more opaque. And again, just flips on all of those pigment genes just before it comes out as a butterfly. So it's a very cool process. I've watched these movies many, many, many times. But it's very informative to teach us the timing. And also, now we're using even fancier microscopes to look at the sub-micron level, what's actually being built inside to produce those little nanostructures. So as a final example, this is a guy that I traveled back down to the Amazon rainforest to study. This is the glasswing butterfly called Greta Otto. And as you can tell, it's pretty invisible. It's really a remarkable species. So most of its wing is just completely transparent. And this is actually pretty uncommon when it comes to terrestrial organisms. So if you ever go diving or look at marine organisms, you've got lots of see-through things. You've got jellyfish, fish, lots of creatures where light just passes through. And this is due in part to, to the fact that um, water has a higher refractive index than air does. So light is just shiny and bounces off surfaces. And for those of you wearing glasses, you might notice that there are often reflections that come off of your glass as well. So this is due in part to the fact that air has a refractive index of 1, and a structure like glass will have a refractive index of 1.5. So that means that there's a lot of surface reflection when light hits that surface and then bounces back off. So what are the butterflies doing to allow them to really not have that much glare is the question. So it turns out if, again, you look really, really, really close. So this, this is showing their scale structures. They're kind of these thin little forked bristles. But then if we start to go at the nanometer scale level, we start to see these little dimples. And so these are on the surface of their wing. They're not very tall. This is about 550 nanometers is the entire wing. And so these are just about 100, about 250 nanometers in height and spaced just about the same width apart. So it turns out what these are doing is actually diffusing light. So there's not a sharp contrast between light hitting the surface and then bouncing off like on our glasses, but rather it interacts and the refractive gradient just changes ever so slightly. It's just kind of like if you had a little bit of a hill and then light just diffused more effectively through it. So really cool technique, and these have actually been applied to um, applications through engineering. There's a common example of solar panels. So we want to collect a lot of light in solar panels, and so these little nano dimples have been produced synthetically in a lab, and these allow light to pass through more efficiently, which again is important if you're trying to collect more light in a solar panel. Um, but you might imagine they might also be useful for cameras or LEDs or glasses. So lots of cool bio-inspiration from butterflies. This is just to name a couple examples. Um, but you can imagine that pretty much if you look close at anything, you're going to find some cool bio-solutions that nature has come up with. So just to recap, what we want to try to understand in the lab with the glass wings is how are they actually producing these structures? Because this little array right here has been synthetically produced by some crazy chemical compounds. 
But nature seems to do it relatively easily with not too much at its disposal. So that's what we want to try and understand as biologists. So just to recap, what I showed you in the beginning was, I think, a little bit misleading. We often just talk about the visible spectrum, but it's just visible to us humans. But there's a lot more out there. What we're showing here in the top is just a slice of electromagnetic radiation in, in terms of its wavelength. So there's a lot more out there, right? We're familiar with radar, with microwaves, infrared, which is just a little bit past the 700 nanometer wavelength of red. And then if we go past towards blue and violet, then we get into our ultraviolet wavelengths, which are much shorter and higher energy, which we can't see, but a lot of other animals can see. So birds, insects. And I think this sometimes becomes very apparent when you look at something like a flower under an ultraviolet light. So if you remove a filter that can now see UV, what you can notice is that the flower looks different. So really what it's showing are these little landing pads so that a pollinating insect now knows how to fly in and find it. So, but you might pick this for a date and give it to them and they're like, sweet, that's a yellow flower, thank you. But to a bee or something, it looks completely different. So next time you buy a flower, think about that, what it might look like to something other than yourself. So that's sort of our pursuit of trying to understand color in a little slice. We've talked about blue, we've talked about pigments, we've talked about transparency but they're just a myriad of cool ways that biology has made color. So it's a really fun thing to study, and I think we've just really scratched the surface on how nature actually produces these structures. So with that, I will close, but I just wanna thank you for coming tonight, and also for the collaborators along the way. It's been a very fun journey, and thank you so much for listening. Go to nerdnight.com to find a Nerd Night event near you. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentations.